Well, hey there, welcome back for another presentation in weather and climate. This time we're going to discuss lightning, thunder, and tornadoes. So some of the context within this presentation is really talking about the sequence and development of lightning, uh, the resulting effect and process of thunder, and then we'll wrap up with a little bit on tornadoes and talking about the sequences involved in all three of these processes. So uh, that being said, let's get going. So let's begin with lightning. Now there are two families of lightning that we're going to discuss in this presentation. The first one is cloud to cloud lightning, and then the uh, second one is going to be cloud to ground lightning. Now cloud to cloud makes up about 80% of the lightning that's observed. Uh, electricity is discharged between the clouds and causes the sky to completely light up, essentially creating what's known as sheet lightning. So it's big flashes that are within the cloud itself. Now cloud to ground lightning is more of what we like to see when it crashes on the ground you can see the lightning bolt come down now that only makes up about 20 percent of all the lightning that occurs but electricity is, dis is discharged and it happens between the base of the cloud and the surface of the ground itself and that's when we get to see a very unique lightning show that you know as it flashes down as it appears <laughs> uh, from the cloud as we'll learn, it actually doesn't flash down, but we'll, you'll see what that means. So moving forward, there is an actual sequence observed. So the first sequence is the electrification of a cloud uh, and charge separation. So the cloud itself uh, is going to hold a charge within those molecules. Uh, you'll have negatively and positively charged molecules. We'll talk more about that. But now that the cloud is charged, the next step uh, will be the development of a path through which the electrons can flow. And then the last one is the discharge, the end result, when we actually get to see the lightning. So let's talk about each one of these sequences a little bit more. So I, I thought this was a great set of diagrams. It shows essentially the sequence of lightning uh, done through a cloud, a tree, the surface, uh, and then looking at both the positive and negatively charged ions uh, within those environments. So we're going to talk about each one of these diagrams uh, in depth, so don't worry, but this is just a nice sequence of putting it all together. So the first one is the charge separation. So positive charge is in the upper portion of the cloud, and then we find that negatively charged ions are in the lower portion of the clouds. And then often there are small pockets, 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 <laughs> a positively charged development along the base of the cloud. Uh, but this is a you know representation of that diagram. Now, lightning occurs in the cloud uh, that extend only above the freezing level because the freezing level of that cloud or the ice crystals development is part of that charge separation. So lighter ice crystals will collide with heavier hailstones as discussed in other presentations. Now these lighter crystals uh, are positively charged and will move upward in the cloud. But when they start to impact the uh, larger hailstones, uh, the hailstones will, are negatively charged and much larger and they will move to the lower portion of the cloud. And so because of those meetings, we now have a separation of dominance of, of uh, positive and negatively charged ions. So then the next step is just now looking specifically at the positively charged ground. So it says that the negative charge at the base of the cloud causes a region on the surface beneath it to also become negatively charged as well. But we also have positively charged features that are much more dense uh, and are also considered protruding objects such as trees, poles, buildings, anything that's essentially bulky and perpendicular to the surface creates a, a, a transition or a connecting point within the atmosphere, within the, the air around it, and the surface. So which brings us in, which, oh, I guess I should mention, you probably have heard that before, that's why they say if you're stuck in the middle of nowhere and there's a lightning storm, they want you to crouch down and get as close to the surface as possible, because it's more likely that a connection will occur to a taller, uh, more prominent feature versus a person, uh, you know, crouch down or laying down on the surface. Uh, the next step is what we call the step leaders. So uh, the dry air that's generally observed is a great electrical insulator. So it actually stops the flow of currents. It cannot occur. Now for cloud to cloud lightning to occur, a step leader must be developed. There must be some 
connecting point that will draw them together. Uh, the leader is generally an ionized particle chamber, it's roughly about 10 centimeters in diameter, that will allow energy to move through it at a rate of about 50 meters per second. So you're going to need this uh, almost this, this tube in which for these, these ions to be able to transfer within one another. And then moving into the last phase is the return stroke, and this is essentially uh, the lightning itself. Now upon connection, uh, the electrons will oop, flow. Oh man, See, that's how you know you make a mistake. Uh, they will flow, uh, resulting in an illuminated return stroke, which uh, is very interesting, I think, uh, to me, because in my whole life I had just assumed that when you see the lightning flash down, that that's what we're seeing is the energy transferring, but actually that's not the case. What we're observing in that lightning stroke is actually a return stroke. So that's actually going from the bottom up. It's the return, uh, the light energy is the return of the actual energy being transferred downward. So it says, although the current is from cloud to ground, the return stroke or the rebound is going to be traveling upwards. but it happens so fast that our eyes cannot see that motion and it just appears as a flash and we just kind of piece it together as looking as a downward uh, travel but it actually the lightning that we see is the return stroke and it's not just one it's actually multiple strokes that will return so there are usually four to five strokes needed in order to neutralize all the negative ions within that cloud so individual strokes are nearly impossible to see but a combination of these strokes make the lightning you know, a little bit brighter and thicker for us to be able to observe as part of that flash. So again, it's not just one uh, flash it's, you know, that we're observing, it's actually a multitude of strokes, generally between four to five, which is what's needed in order to balance or to neutralize um, those ions, which I think is really interesting. Because again, you know, most of us just assume that it's just one big flash, but you know, this diagram does a great representation showing that there's actually more than one. In this one here, there are four strokes. You have the first, second, and third, and then the fourth stroke at the end. Uh, notice how it's traveling within the same design and pattern for the most part, which is kind of interesting, I think. So let's wrap up with, uh, with flashes and let's move in to thunder. So let's talk about thunder. I don't know about you, but when I, this whole video, I keep thinking of ACDC's uh, song. Anyway, uh, so looking at thunder. Now, that's the thing that we hear, obviously. Lightning is what we see. Uh, th thunder is what we hear. And they certainly are very close related as to why they occur. Now, the lightning stroke can heat the air through which it travels to about 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly five times hotter than the sun. Now, due to this incredible heat um, that is observed and felt you know, within that, that line of sight, it causes the air to expand explosively as to how quickly that heat is being introduced. Now that ex you know that expansion, that explosive expansion, uh, results in what, what's considered a shock wave. So it's breaking like the sound barrier, right? So we're able to then hear the crack from that expansion of those molecules. And it takes about five seconds for thunder to travel about one mile, uh, obviously depending on the environment. But I, I don't know if you were, when you were a kid, when it used to have these uh, thunderstorms, and you would uh, see the lightning and then listen and count the seconds for the thunder to try to develop or count, uh, you know, to extrapolate the distance in which that lightning strike must have been uh, in relation to your location. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was only one, <laughs> but I remember doing that. Now, that being said, if we put this kind of together, we can talk about air mass thunderstorms. So the big ones, the cumulonimbus storm systems that are very, very large. And we'll also introduce the three steps or the three stages within this development. Now, air mass thunderstorms are contained within a uniform air mass and generally away from a front. They're also very localized, so it's a big storm system within a certain area. So you would experience, you know, a, a mass thunderstorm in one like area, one town, one city in which it's experiencing, so it's one localized event. What's also interesting about them is that they are self-extinguished and short-lived. Uh, now the sequence consists of a number of cells, but each of these cells going through these stages of the cumulus mature and then dissipative. Um, since we're kind of speaking of this, something I wanted to mention, living in Southern California, we are 
prone to fire season during the summer. And something that we get to experience a lot here, which is very unique, which is not seen in many places, unless you know you experience the fires that we do, are the pyrocumulus, which are essentially these massive thunder clouds, thunderstorm clouds that develop when you have a raging fire uh, that goes over some very rich vegetation that generally has a lot of water or moisture still around it and it will cause immediate evaporation to occur, which will create this massive, incredible rising effect. Uh, you usually get a little bit of lightning within cloud to cloud lightning, and then all of a sudden it will just dissipate on its own once the fire has moved past uh, that source, which I think is interesting because it kind of relates similar to these as well. Um, the image down below, we'll spend some time in, or in a moment discussing each one of these stages, but we can see the developing or cumulus stage, then we have the mature stage in which we now have uh, you know, the you know, precipitation occurring and then the dissipating stage, which is when the air mass thunderstorm itself begins to run out of fuel and kind of puts itself out. So let's talk about each one of these. So the cumulus or developing stage. Now, unstable air will rise as the surface experiences rapid heating. These updrafts will, of air will cool adiabatically or will cool as they rise because they're getting farther away from that heat source. So if enough water vapor is present, vertical cloud development will occur at the rate of this movement is between 10 and 45 miles an hour. So it's actually uh, quite quick. I mean, you could watch these clouds begin. You could almost watch them develop upwards and creating this large, uh, you know, column of air. You know, remember, cumulus uh, implies uh, heaps or chunks. So we're seeing this really big, chunky, you know, feature developing uh, at its main stage. Now, what will end up happening is it will reach its mature stage, which becomes uh, cumulonimbus, but nimbus meaning uh, rain bearing. Uh, this stage is reached when the precipitation is present along with both up and down drafts. So you have a strong updraft which is con continuing to feed the cloud. You also have a downdraft which is going to cause precipitation uh, in which you're going to lose some of the uh, water vapor as rain droplets. Uh, there is also lightning and thunder developed within this system. And then what's interesting is that the cloud tops, or meaning that it stops rising uh, where the atmosphere is uh, is stable. And that being said, you then create that anvil head, as we can see here. Uh, the anvil head uh, is actually a great tail tell sign of the direction of you know, of the wind flow, the upper wind flow, because the anvil head appears as the wind blows the ice crystals downstream. So we know that the upper air in this diagram is actually moving towards the right. So now you've got this really incredible intense storm, uh, and then at some point you no longer have the formative updraft that is refueling or recharging the system. So this is when the downdraft has dominated all the rain flow, flow itself. Um, and surpasses the updraft, preventing further addition of that water vapor, and then precipitation will just essentially uh, cease because there's not a continued source of new water vapor, and uh, the cloud will essentially evaporate. And that's really the process of these very large thunderstorms that we see. Uh, so then the next step is, you know, which kind of you know relates with this, is what about tornadoes? So we talked about lightning. We've talked about thunder. We've talked about large air masses and thunderstorms. So now we get to talk about tornadoes, which is where we're gonna wrap up within this presentation for you today. Now, the tornadoes are a direct result of some of these massive thunderstorms, uh, and we'll talk a little more about that. But, you know, zones of extremely rapid cooling will experience rotating winds beneath the base of the cloud. That rotation in the northern hemisphere is generally counterclockwise, and it will be clockwise in the southern hemisphere, and that's due to the pressure gradient, the large difference in that pressure gradient of high and low pressure. And the movement is between uh, 30 to 280 miles per hour. The diagram on the right is kind of shows a, a photo of an actual uh, vortex or tornado. Uh, but we'll talk more about what these are. Again, we can talk about tornadoes for an entire month, uh, but I only have four slides total. You know, it's There's only so much we can do in this time that we've got together. So this is a very simplified uh, diagram showing the tornado development being, uh, you know, at the beginning, about 15 minutes into its development, and then at this 30-minute mark. 
So at the beginning, we can see there's no clouds. Uh, you have an outflow boundary, uh, essentially a convergence zone, upward motion. The upward motion is due to uh, convection cells moving air upward and also moving in uh, water vapor if available. At some point, it will cool uh, through expansion and you'll end up creating a new convective development or clouds here. Um, and we can, uh, we can start to see within these blue arrows showing that spinning, that rotation of essentially a tornado. Whether, but it's not a tornado there, but we can start to see uh, that counterclockwise motion, the uh, circular advection uh, vertically. So then we move into the final stage, about the 30 minute mark, and now we can see that we have now rapid convective growth. So the cloud is growing rapidly, uh, it's now turned into a full on anvil head or a cumulonimbus. And because of that, uh, you have very strong convective uh, updrafts, which will stretch and essentially intensify the vortex into what's now observed as a tornado. So now that you've got this incredible uplift that's occurring, this updraft, uh, that's very, very fueled and charged, it's gonna start picking and moving up material and feeding the storm clouds. So it's really growing this storm system. And so the, you know, the greater that is, the larger the tornado will be. Which brings us to this next diagram, uh, which is, you know, again, the development. This is using a, an example. Uh, this is one a tornado that was 1989 in Bangladesh. It was considered one of the most devastating. Um, there were about uh, 1,300 victims within this, uh, this tornado system. So the first step, as we can see, the initial funnel, which hovers over the surface, grows uh, from a thundercloud. Uh, if the conditions are favorable, temperature, swings, etc., our tornado will take shape and will actually then, you can actually see it touching the surface of the earth. So you can see, again, you know, that the vortex has become so large uh, and well-defined that it now is making impact on the surface, and we can see it. Then we get into stage three, which is when the conditions start to change. The funnel will become very narrow, it will not have that driving force, and it, it gradually will remove itself from the surface and it's, you know, touchdown uh, system and it will start to pull itself back up and will become much weaker. So uh, again, this diagram is just kind of you know, putting those things in perspective. We can see that it's got a clockwise rotation. You got cold at the top, crosswinds, warm air at the bottom. We have our spiral movement, air speeds at the funnel are about 200 meters per second, uh, so on and so forth. And the, this, this one here had a, a lifespan of up to seven hours, which was incredible. Now, based on the speed in which the, these tornadoes rotate, we actually give it a name. We can you know, you know, regulate them. I mean, this is something we really don't deal a whole lot with in California. But in the Midwest, in Tornado Alley, this is a very common system that develops. So this is the Fujita uh, tornado scale, uh, giving it, you know, uh, you know F0 to an F5, giving it you know, an estimate of wind of miles per hour, so if it's between 75 and 112, it would give it a rating of an F1. And we would say this is moderate damage, you know, it will peel the surface off of roofs, mobile homes might be pushed off their foundation, so on and so forth, maybe an F4, devastating damage, well-constructed homes could be leveled, structures with weak foundations could be even picked up and blown away. So it's just incredible to think that, you know, this, this energy transfer of temperature and air can become so intense that it can literally pick up buildings. It's just very uh, incredible. I mean, it's terrifying, <laughs> but you know, as a science, it's incredible to understand that we live in such a dynamic place. So, you know, this was, you know, again, crash course in tornadoes with just some of the fundamentals. You know, we'll continue to talk more about uh, extreme weather throughout these additional videos. But maybe, maybe you have experienced a tornado. Maybe you've seen one. You know, I'm not talking about just those dirt devils, those real small uh, pressure uh, gradient ones. I'm talking about these big ones. Be sure to comment below. Don't forget to like the video if it was helpful. And uh, if you have not yet, don't forget to subscribe. And we'll talk soon.